Hey, I'm Chris Ralph, the professional prospector, and you know, today we're going to talk about the purity of natural gold. Now, there's a bunch of videos out there on YouTube about how to purify gold scrap, like you could take old jewelry or electronic junk or some other things, and you can dissolve them and create pure gold. But what about natural gold? Gold just as it comes out of the ground. Well, what purity is natural gold? Is it is it always pretty much the same wherever you get it? Uh, can can you tell by the color? Can the color tell you what you want to know? Well, what color really is gold? Well, let's take a look and see. Let's look at some pictures of different colored gold. So here are five nuggets. The upper two are the normal yellow color that you would expect for nice natural gold nuggets. But the bottom three, the smaller ones, are gold too. They're also gold nuggets, but they have a lot of silver in them. And so they're kind of a, a yellow, green, silver kind of color. This is a, a material known as electrum, and we're going to be talking more about that in this video. This is a very beautiful specimen of electrum gold, very high silver, but a very beautiful crystalline pattern. And this is a kind of a thing that would sell for a lot of money. But you look at this and you may say, well, I just see silver. But it really is, uh, may depend on the, the device that you're looking at it, it really is a pale, pale yellow color. It's gold, but it's probably on the order of 40% silver. Now, natural gold, my point, is never pure, okay? It, it varies a lot, actually, and that's why you get all those different colors. Um, you know, even nuggets of about the same purity, depending on what metals and stuff are in them, can vary a lot depending you know, depending on the color, you know, the, even though if they have about the same amount of gold, they can have different shades and tones. Usually if it's really close, the shade or tone will be close, but it still varies. You can't just look at the color and say, oh yeah, I know that's 95% pure gold. Well, it, it just doesn't work really that way. Because gold varies a lot in color, let's take a look at some more pictures of different colored bits of gold, both uh, gold that uh, is natural and we'll even take a look at a little bit of gold that's man-made. This is the kind of buttery yellow, bright gold colored nugget that we're used to. This is from uh, the North Fork of the Yuba River in Sierra County in the Motherlode country of California. This is what you expect for average gold color, but it's not what everything looks like. Here's some more really nice big nuggets. If you look closely at this gold, it's a little lighter, just a hair lighter than the, the last piece. A little less yellow and the truth is this is a little bit higher in silver this uh, material as I remember these nuggets uh, ran around 80% gold and of course the different colored gold alloys uh, get used in jewelry like this is a Black Hills gold ring and you know the the pinkish colored pieces of gold on there are actually alloyed with copper so that they take gold and a, an excess of copper to get the pink color but the green is actually uh, alloyed with an excess of silver. There's a certain level of silver in gold. When you add it, it starts looking green. And then eventually, as you add more and more silver, it just gets paler and paler in color to where it's pretty much all silver colored. So the different alloys of gold and the different colors of gold, they're used in jewelry and, and are appreciated for other purposes. Now we had that fairly high silver gold that I showed you that's called electrum. And you know, when silver is present in ores and the amounts of silver in the gold are, are significant, uh, it's called electrum. And actually the first coins ever made by man many thousands of years ago were made out of electrum, an, a natural gold silver alloy. Now, uh, they, we're going to take a look at the different kinds of deposits that produce different things. And actually, uh, deposits that are rich in silver have a tendency to produce, surprise, silver-rich gold. 
And Nevada is actually well known for that. Nevada is famous. These are called epithermal deposits. And I've done some videos about Bonanza epithermal deposits and that kind of stuff. But uh, we're going to take a look. Let's take a look at some uh, at a diagram that shows the relation of epithermal deposits and how they form comparatively near the surface. Okay, here's my little diagram that I have that shows the relation of gold deposits and the depth that they form at. You know, you can see at the surface is uh, placer deposits in streams and rivers in the hills. But next down is uh, epithermal and VMS and so on and so forth. The epithermal type is here, comparatively close to the surface. And here's the close-up. Uh, as it says, epithermal deposits are created close to the surface and typically in areas where magma comes near to the surface enough that it can provide heat to drive the systems. And it's often, in fact, uh, that epithermal deposits are found in uh, volcanic rocks themselves, although not always. Uh, they can be super rich in gold and silver and other metals as well. So you have these ores and deposits that are rich in both silver and gold together. And uh, because you have them together, you tend to get a lot of silver in your gold. And in fact, when they first discovered, discovered the Comstock up on up by Virginia City, which is, you know, not that far from where I live in northern Nevada, when they first discovered the Comstock, they, they found placer that had eroded out of some of the, the vein structures of the Comstock load, and it was super low. It was high in silver, low in gold. It was only about, oh, maybe 60% pure gold. And the other, most of the rest being silver with a little copper and some other things. But most of the rest was silver. And so uh, when they turned their gold in, the price of gold, pure gold in those days was $20.67 an ounce. The early Comstock placer miners only got about twelve dollars an ounce for the because there was only about twelve dollars worth of gold in every ounce of nuggets that they turned in. So let's take let's talk a little bit more about epithermal gold silver deposits and take a look at some epithermal go, electrum gold. This specimen of real pale yellow gold. Uh, was found in Elko County in Nevada by a friend of mine with a metal detector. Uh, it's, it's a nice specimen of electrum. Here's another specimen of Nevada electrum. Uh, this is very pale, uh, almost silvery colored, and was found again uh, with a metal detector at the side of an old mine in an old dump that they had uh, next to it uh, by a, another friend of mine. It's, uh, it's a nice piece, and the, the wire gold is... Uh, really good to see. Now another kind of gold deposit that's pretty common is what they call orogenic. And orogenic is a fancy scientific word. It just means related to mountain building. So it's related to the you know formation of mountains and stuff like that. And this kind of gold is typical over in the mother load country in California and other places too. Don't get me wrong, there's a lot of other places that are orogenic. Uh, most of the gold in Australia is orogenic. But uh, the, the, those are a couple of examples of that. And these types of deposits form way down deep. They, uh, they form super deep. And let me show you the diagram, the same diagram, and we'll take a look at the deep orogenic deposits. Okay, here's my diagram again that shows the relative depth of formation of various types of gold deposits, common ones. And the deepest of the group here is the orogenic here at the bottom. It forms at depths of several miles up to maybe five or even 10 miles deep from the Earth's surface. And here's the close up. And like I say, these deposits form uh, under mountain building types of environments, often where the Earth's tectonic plates have collided and then built up mountains from the collision. 
The gold, along with other minerals, is often found in quartz veins, but, you know, in the epithermals, it's often found in quartz veins, too, so that's not really anything unique. One of these, uh, one of the things about these types of deposits is that they're generally low in base metals in, and also silver, and so uh, they tend to be more just about the gold, not about gold and silver or gold and copper and other various base metals. Now this kind of deposit doesn't form uh, with a lot of silver usually. Although I'll tell you, I've been in orogenic gold areas and gotten the occasional nugget that has high silver in it, has that kind of greenish color to it, but uh, it's not the norm. You know, let's take a look at some orogenic uh, gold nuggets and you'll see that these nuggets generally are more of your uh, typical yellow gold color. And here's some uh, nuggets that I took from the Mother Lode country in California. They're all from an orogenic type of uh, deposit. And they're, you know, the nice yellow metallic color that you expect for gold nuggets. But like I say, over the years, I've found a few silver, high silver, greenish colored nuggets in California and the Mother Lode country too. So they're not unheard of. So how do you know what the purity is of the gold where you're prospecting? I mean, you know, if you happen to know whether it's epithermal or orogenic or whatever type of formation, you know, like I say, it's not a perfect guide, although there's a general rule that epithermals tend to be more silver rich, but you can get real high purity gold out of epithermal deposits too. It just depends on the actual formation of the deposit. So, you know, one of the things that I encounter when I talk to prospectors at clubs or at shows or that kind of thing is that almost all prospectors, when I get to talking about what the purity is of the natural gold that they're digging and, and when they're out there prospecting, they almost always way overestimate. I get people telling me, oh yeah, Chris, my gold, it's it's 98% pure or it's 96% pure, 95. And, and it's like, well, is there actually ever gold that's 98 or 95% pure or something in between in that range? Yeah, I, there is some gold that forms that pure, but not very much. The more typical numbers that you'll see for most uh, placer deposits, even orogenic, is more in the range of... 80, 85, 90, maybe into the low 90s. Those 95 and 98 real high purity stuff, those are one in a hundred or even less, and especially at the 98% end. The 95, eh, you know, maybe one in a hundred. 92 or 93, maybe one in 50. And you start getting below 90, yeah, that's pretty typical. Uh, you know, 90, 91, you know, the 87, those are all numbers that are pretty typical for purity of natural gold. Another problem that I see uh, prospectors, you know, when they talk to me is they don't consider the impurities that are in their placer gold. So almost all natural gold has some iron oxides or quartz or other things like that. Uh, let's take a look at some pictures of that and I'll show you. So let's start out talking about iron oxides. Now look at this gold here and you can see that almost all of this gold, or at least a huge portion of it, has rusty red-brown colored material on there that looks like rust. Well, it is. It's basically iron oxides, the same as rust on a nail, and uh, that's not gold. And so if you were to look at the purity of this overall, you weighed out so many ounces, and then when you sent it to a refiner, he said, well, we only had so many ounces of gold in there, you probably would look at the gold and say, hey, look, I weighed out 10 ounces of gold. How come I only got paid for eight? And, you know, what you're not taking into account is the iron oxides, but also the quartz. So here I've used yellow circles to circle all the obvious quartz in each of these nuggets. And, uh, you know, it can add up to quite a bit, especially combined with the iron oxides. When By the time you 
think about all the impurities and rock and stuff, and not even counting the weight of the gold metal, uh, the, or the purity of the gold metal, you know, the just the junk, the iron oxides and quartz and whatever other junk, it can really drop your purity down quite a bit. The truth is, the only way to know for sure what the purity of your gold is, is with an assay. And most of the guys that tell me, oh, I got 98% pure gold, I tell them, you got any assays that, that show that? They say, well, no, Bob told me that it was really rich and that it's that high. And, you know, if you, if you can find Bob and ask him, it's like, oh, well, Joe told me that it was 98% pure. And, and you end up finding out that somebody told somebody told somebody and nobody has any actual assay results that say what the purity is. So what about assay results? Well, I have this old book. And this is actually a, a reprint of a part of a much larger book. And, and that you can actually, if you search for this uh, online, there are copies of this California Mines book by Charles Yale uh, from 1899 that you can download a free copy, a PDF version online. But it has various articles in it, but one of the cool things that it has is an article on the fineness of California gold. And it's, it's based on results from the mint, from actual assays that uh, show what the purity is for various counties and mineral deposits and gold deposits in, in California, because this is a California book, right? And it shows that the gold purity is really more like what I say. If you look, a lot of the numbers are, you know, in the, the mid 80s, sometimes even in the low 80s. Uh, now, and there are also numbers in here, occasional numbers that are as high as the, uh, the low 90s. So here's one that's 89. That's, you know, different. I mean, I mean, 89 is high for, a, and these are averages for various counties. Um, Nevada County in California in 1899, average fineness, 85 and a half. Uh, El Dorado County, average fineness, 86.8. Uh, Plumas County, I do a lot of prospecting in Plumas County, uh, 85.1. Uh, Sierra County, also do a lot of prospecting in Sierra, Sierra County, 85.8. Mariposa County, 80.5. So, uh, the, the highest of these is for Sacramento County, and it's 89. Now, there are individual mines and stuff, and they talk about this here, individual mines that certainly do have higher numbers. Um, the, there's a mine called the Blue Rock in Georgetown. He, he guys listed here that's 90%. Uh, there's another one here in El Dorado County, an individual mine that's 94.8%. Uh, but again, if you look at these, it's just the exceptions. It's not the, the norm. Now, there are a couple counties in California. Uh, Mono County is one where the, and it talks about this in here, that the, the big producer at, at this time in the late 1800s was the Bodie District. Bodie is now a California state park, but hey, in the late 1800s, it was a going concern producing a lot of gold. And their gold was only a little over 50% pure because it's an epithermal deposit and uh, it had a lot of silver in it. And now they, you know, when they had big amounts that they produced, like the mines in Bodie, they'd get paid for the silver and the gold, but uh, the gold that they produced was pretty low grade, 50 something percent was typical. In fact, this in here, let's see in some shipments that they made from Bodie that were like 48%, less than 50% gold. This is more like the Electrum that we've been talking about and showing pictures of. So, you know, that's something that, that you, you want to think about. One of the things that you should note, and I, I noticed here that Sacramento County uh, had among the highest counties, it was nine, or I'm sorry, 89% pure. Well, why did Sacramento have such high numbers when uh, Plumas and Sierra and some of the other northern counties were more like 85? And even Mariposa County, way down at the south end of the mother load, 
was 80 point something. Why did uh, Sacramento have higher? Well, the truth is, is as gold works its way down in a river or a stream, the silver actually gets leached out of it. Yeah, the, the silver, um, you, you have gold, you have a nugget of gold, and there's a, a mixture of gold and silver in there. And on the surface, the oxygen in the water will actually react with the silver there that's on the surface of the nugget and leach out the silver. And so, especially when you have little tiny pieces of gold, so you have a lot of surface area for the amount of size of gold. Like if you have a fist sized nugget, well, you only have this much surface. You have a whole lot of gold on the inside. But if you have a little tiny flake that's just, you know, flat flake and it's tiny, tiny, it's got a lot of surface area. And so it, as the oxygen attacks the silver in the little flake, you get uh, actual silver being dissolved out of it. And that's why, because Sacramento County is really more a dredge and downstream type of, of county. There's not hard rock deposits in Sacramento County. For those of you who know California, you know Sacramento itself is down in the valley. So that's how it works. Literally, as, as gold goes downstream, slowly, 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 the silver gets leached out of the surface of the nugget. And as you, if you have small nuggets, that can add up to significant percentage. So instead of being 85% like it was in, in Plumas and Sierra and some of the other counties, by the time you get down to uh, the Sacramento area where they were mining, you know, gravels that are way down in the valley with bucket line dredges, that gold is going to be a few percent more. It's going to be 89. So that tells you a little bit about that. But it also brings up another issue that I do get people asking me about. Well, don't gold nuggets grow in the gravel? I mean, isn't that how gold nuggets form? Like they grow like a little thing that starts out like a seed and just grows and grows and grows and grows and grows? I'm sorry, that's, that's not how gold nuggets form. Gold nuggets form in hot solutions, in veins and other kinds of deposits and by erosion and stuff, that gold that's formed in the hard rock gets washed down into streams and down and down and down, eventually all the way out to the ocean. And, but that's how it works. Gold uh, really doesn't grow. And, and I, I'm gonna get people arguing with me, yes it does, I know it does. Uh, old Joe told me that it does. It's like, okay, well let me tell you some of the science behind that. They actually have done tests and uh, they've opened up and etched and looked at nuggets. And if a nugget was growing like that in a, a stream gravel, it would grow and look like the rings of a tree, you know, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And, and you would have this growth like tree rings. They opened up a bunch of nuggets and looked at them. Guess how many looked like tree rings? Zero. Another thing about that is that uh, uh, at high temperatures, with a lot of energy and you know, high heat and stuff like that, um, the growing gold can just incorporate the silver into, into the space of the crystals that it grows. It doesn't have any problem taking it up. But if it were to grow at like room temperature or you know the typical temperatures outside, you'd find that it, it, it can't it, it, it would it just naturally push the silver out. And in fact, there are uh, uh, deposits in Michigan that are copper and gold. And, uh, and they grow and, and there's silver and there's copper and, and they, the silver and copper literally separate each other. And, and it's, it's separated as it grows. Let me show you a picture. Let's talk about it. So this nugget is from Michigan where the copper nuggets and sometimes silver grow at temperatures basically on the surface you know cold room temperature uh, that kind of thing and they grow from solutions and then you look at this and you see that the silver and gold have separated each other at the cool temperatures the copper or the silver can't incorporate each other into 
the the metal that they're forming at elevated temperatures inside veins and that sort of thing you can incorporate uh, copper into silver silver into gold all those sorts of things but at room temperature you'd get something like this so if nuggets grew at room temperature the silver that was with them would be separated instead of having copper silver nuggets like this you'd have a gold silver nugget separated the two of them like this but the truth is they grow at high temperatures and that's why it's mixed so let's summarize you know what is the purity of natural gold it varies a lot if you have epithermal silver rich deposits whether you're working the uh, the hard rock original source or you're working placer that eroded down, that's another thing about uh, growth of gold and things. If you have a source that's a, a silver rich epithermal, guess what? The placer gold is going to be silver rich epithermal. And if you have a source that's a silver poor orogenic, guess what? The nuggets downstream of that are going to be uh, silver poor orogenic gold rich nuggets. They go together. That's where the nuggets come from. But just to summarize and to go through this and talk about, you know, what the real purity of natural gold is, most natural gold that isn't obviously silver rich, pale colored, is going to be on the order of 80 to 90 percent. Okay. Now, are there exceptions? You betcha. Absolutely exceptions. Rare. But they're exceptions. They do exist. Um, but the only way to really know what your particular gold is, is with an assay test. And, you know, the, the book that I showed you, the 1899 book, that's based on hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of assay tests. In the old days when miners found gold, what they'd do to convert it to, to money is they'd send it to the mint. And the mint would assay their gold and give them back uh, coins in, in exchange. So if you gave them, uh, you know, 10 ounces of gold, well, they'd give you that value in gold coins. So uh, they have loads and loads of assays from testing all the gold that miners brought them. So that's what real assay results say. It may be, you know, maybe you thought it was more, but, you know, only an assay will tell for sure. Now, uh, you know, if you want to be a better prospector and find more gold so that you can send it into a refiner and get it assayed, I wrote a book about how to find more gold, how to increase your skills as a prospector. My book is called Fistful of Gold, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about my book right now. So let me tell you a little bit more about my book. Um, it's called Fistful of Gold, and I wrote it because I want you to be able to go out and find for yourself Fistful of Gold. And uh, you can see that it's a, an encyclopedia with all kinds of information, pictures, and that sort of thing. It's not in color, but uh, uh, color would have cost me a lot more to have printed, and so the book would have cost a lot more. It's for sale on Amazon, and you can pick it up. I'll put a link in the description below. I also serve as the editor for a, a prospecting magazine. It's ICMJ's Prospecting and Mining Journal. And honestly, you should check that out. We've got stories uh, and information, legal stuff, everything you know to increase your skills as a prospector. I write articles in this every month and a lot of other very experienced prospectors contribute to the magazine as well. So check the magazine out. Also, I have a website and the website is uh, at nevadaoutbackgems.com. I'll put a link for it in the description below, but there's gobs of information there that you will find useful in your prospecting efforts. Finally, I want to say that I really appreciate your comments and thoughts and even a positive criticism. Don't come on there and just toss out insults because I'll just delete your comments. But if you've got uh, helpful things to say and questions to ask, do write and, and put those in the comments because I answer my comments to people and uh, you'll hear from me in, in, you know, in, in responding to you. 
Uh, so if you've enjoyed this video and you like what you see and you're interested in uh, finding out more, well then sign up, subscribe, and hit the, uh, the notification bell so they'll let you know when I post new videos. And, you know, like it and share it if, again, you, you see stuff that you really are excited about. And I'll be coming out with lots more new videos. And so we'll see you again real soon.